From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Joe Matthew, I'm Kaylee Lyons. As the Senate pushes the $95 billion emergency funding bill to the House of Representatives, President Biden tears into former President Trump for his comments last weekend on NATO. For God's sake, it's dumb, it's shameful, it's dangerous, it's un-American. NATO is a sacred commitment. We'll speak with Melinda Herring from the Atlantic Council. January CPI comes in hotter than expected, pushing back expectations for a Fed rate cut before July. Jared Bernstein from the White House Council of Economic Advisors joins us this hour. And it's special election day in New York for the seat once held by former Congressman George Santos. We'll have all you need to know about the race for New York 3. It's one that we're watching closely here, Kaylee, in a a race that's frankly too close to call but could impact the balance of power here on Capitol Hill in a meaningful way considering this thin margin in the House. Absolutely. It has the potential to get even thinner as the House is ready to deal with some pretty big legislative issues, including now the supplemental aid package, as we mentioned, yep. because we all woke up to the news. It had passed the Senate and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer took a victory lap on that this morning. Today, after not just a long night and weekend, but after months of work, we can say it's been worth it. Today we witnessed one of the most historic and consequential bills pass the Senate, a bill that so greatly impacts not just our national security, not just the security of our allies, but also the security of Western democracy as we know it. And the bill did pass, of course, Joe, with Republican support, 22 Republicans voting in yep. favor. But is that enough of a mandate mm -hmm. to get Republicans that lead the House right. to get this on the floor, let alone pass it? Well, that remains a big question, and it's certainly one that they're asking at the White House today. President Biden added pressure to House Speaker Mike Johnson to take the next step. Here he is. I urge Speaker Johnson to bring it to the floor immediately, immediately. There's no question that the Senate bill was put on the floor in the House of Representatives, it would pass. It would pass. And the Speaker knows that. So I call on the Speaker to let the full House speak its mind and not allow a minority of most extreme voices in the House to block this bill even from being voted on. Joining us now at the table, Bloomberg's Wendy Benjaminson and Enda Curran. It's great to see you both. Wendy, let's begin with you. He's calling on Mike Johnson to do something that the speaker's uh, simply prepared not to do. He issued, not to do. Determined, he issued a preemptive rejection. That's such classic Washington speak. Didn't even wait for the bill to pass. So we don't think right. this is going to the House. No, right? it's not. And I'd be interested in seeing the White House's whip count of votes that he is convinced would pass the House. Mm -hmm. There are a large number, or at least enough Republicans in this narrowly divided House to uh, to block that bill. And Speaker Johnson doesn't even have to bring it to the floor. There's some discussion today about this move <laughs> called a discharge petition, yeah. which is you're very not, complicated. You're not buying into it, are you? I, well, I think it would take a lot of work and a lot of support from both sides working together, which is not something we've seen a whole lot of lately. Um, and so it's it's unlikely to happen. Also, Republicans, even those who might be for the bill, might think twice about going against the speaker. It's just it, in old school anyway. It's not done. Um, there are those who might move to get rid of him if this does go to the floor, too. Well, I would note that Hakeem Jeffries, Jeffries, the Democratic leader in the House, held a news conference just in the last hour saying he thinks there's 300 votes that would vote for this if ultimately they have a chance to. And he said he'd use every legislative tool he can, which would imply a discharge petition potentially, right. even if it's actually harder to do in practice than theoretically. I think that's what you're getting at. Yes, exactly. And it sounds, though, that me Speaker Johnson is listening, as we call him here, to the audience of one. <laughs> there is one person who doesn't want this to pass, just like he didn't want the border bill to pass. That's former President Donald Trump, who wants... Who, is, who wants this to be an issue in the campaign and wants, is very much against, I should say, 
um, you know, any foreign assistance, especially against Russia. You've made the point as well. Kaylee, it's not just Republicans, but Democrats might have a, a, a problem specifically progressives with the Israel component exactly. here. Exactly. So we'll see what three the math voted, looks like. Three votes against it in the Senate last that's night right. from Democrats. Yeah, right. It's important to keep in mind. To, to return, though, to your point, Wendy, on the idea of um, Mike Johnson getting ousted, that's where Democrats, too, could come in, Joe. Mm -hmm. Could they act to protect him? which they did not do with Speaker McCarthy, but if it were to allow the supplemental aid package to get through, perhaps it's a different calculation this go around. Yeah, that's a lot of deal-making. I don't know, to the extent that we should be uh, reading into what Hakeem Jeffries is saying, is he prepared to save Mike Johnson? Because in the past, the answer has been no. In the past, the answer has been no, but there's been more and more talk that these, this legislation is so important and the president does want it passed and Democrats presumably support the president in his re-election year and would, um, would work to keep the speaker in, pl in his job yeah. only to get the legislation passed. Whether politics, I don't know. It's hard to tell anymore <laughs> if anybody's going to play by sure. the rule book or totally. not. Yeah. Well, and on the subject of it being an election year for that very reason, when voters are getting ready to head to the polls in November, mm -hmm. how they think about the economy is also something that the president has to consider. And if you look at the economic data today, Enda Curran, it's not necessarily a print that the administration would have liked to see. Hotter inflation than expected. How worried should we be that this is the start of a reacceleration? rather than the disinflationary kind of pressures everyone was hoping for. It wasn't good news today on the inflation front. Headlining core inflation faster than expected. Food prices up. Prices for car insurance up. Prices for health care up. These are the staples that everyone pays for every day of the week. So there's an economic story there and that it goes to the whole what's going to happen interest rates debate. And I thought the, this story was meant to be all about disinflation. Prices would cool this year. Um, but that's now in question. And of course, there's an econ a political story in terms of how this spills over into people's attitudes when it comes to uh, you know, voting in the election later this year. So not a good inflation reading for either the Fed or White House today. Is it safe to say we're going to hear from the White House a little bit later this hour, that the administration is essentially powerless at this point to impact inflation. They've taken a whack at supply chain. There have been some other actions the administration has taken. But are they just watching this with the rest of us now? Well, look, the case for the defence is there could be some seasonal impacts from January here. It's when contracts get reset, especially like insurance contracts in the health sector, etc. So maybe January was the, was the bad hit and February and March we get back to this disinflation story. But... Others will say to you, we're now into this famous last mile being the hardest. There's plenty of nuts in the system in the services side of things. Plenty still of pressure on, on shortages of key services, for example, shortages of labour in some areas. Yeah. Um, none of that is going to be fixed in a hurry. It won't be fixed by the Fed. As you say, the government isn't, clearly isn't managing to iron out all the nuts in the system. The end result is we have inflation still considerably higher than where the official target wants it to be. Which is why the Fed is worried about potentially cutting too early, yeah. a message we've been hearing from them consistently for weeks now. Bloomberg's Enda Kern, thank you so much, alongside Bloomberg's Wendy Benjamins, and we appreciate it. And coming up, we'll continue this conversation. Get the economic take from the White House. Jared Bernstein of the Council of Economic Advisors joins us next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. This is a bit of a bruising CPI report. There are certain aspects of this report which push the numbers higher. It's not good news. We would have preferred to have seen something a little bit uh, less than that. This is not bad. It's just cooling more slowly. That last mile of getting down to target after rapid deceleration is proving to be a little bit chewy. There's a lot of things that the Fed is not going to like about this. It does complicate the messaging and the decision making for the Fed. We now had to punt on rate cuts further into the year. I think that the Fed has been trying to guide the market narrative to expecting less this year. The Fed will not be cutting rates as much as the market expected. Is a rate cut going to happen in March? Knowing what I know right now, probably not. We're still thinking we'll, we'll avoid recession, so three rate cuts is what we get. May is still a long way away. We still have a long day between now and May, and we'll see how the whole totality of the data pan out between now and then. 
Investors and economists reacting to a fresh inflation report that showed prices rising faster than expected in the U.S. in January. Joining us now from the White House is Jared Bernstein, chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. Jared, always great to have you on the show. Of course, the White House had to react to a number like the one we saw today. We did get a statement from the president himself. He addressed things like drug prices, drunk uh, Junk fees, shrinkflation. He said he'll stand in the way of congressional Republicans' efforts to cut taxes and Medicare benefits. I saw no mention, though, of housing and shelter costs contributed to about two thirds of the overall increase we saw in CPI. What can the administration do to address that? We have a very deep, and I would argue, extremely important housing agenda. Uh, it shows up in our budget, and uh, it. Uh, has the potential to increase the supply of affordable housing by 2 million units, so really making a dent in really a 10-year uh, um, uh, time frame which in, within which this affordable housing shortage uh, has become so acute. Now, uh, it's interesting you raise that because we know that that was part of the uh, uh, inflation report this morning, the higher uh, shelter prices. and. Look, any month to month can bounce either way, uh, but this long-term misalignment between housing demand and housing supply, and again, this is a, a problem a, a decade in the making, uh, is in the background there, including uh, of this morning's result. Jared, I see you've got your CPI day hat on. When you <laughs> look ahead to future CPI days, how likely is it, based on history, based on the conditions that, that you're aware of now, that we see a resurgence in inflation? That that might even prompt higher interest rates. You've said before this doesn't work in a straight line. How likely is that? Well, first of all, this is the hat I wear every day. <laughs> so it's my jobs day hat, my CPI day hat, GDP day maybe hat. Maybe this is just uh, when we see you. <laughs> yeah, I, maybe I should get a different hat for each, each report. Uh, well, um, to think about. look, the, the, tr the, trend, the trend is our friend in the following sense. So let's not forget that uh, the CPI came down from 3.4 percent year over year in December to 3.1, and back in June of 22, it was 9.1. So it's down two thirds off of its peak. And of course, uh, gas was a negative. We've seen declines in used new car prices, some other categories. You heard the president talking about our work to continue uh, to lower costs in prescription drugs, insulin, health coverage. So. Uh, we've got more work to do, but keeping those prices moving down and building on this trend is uh, is very much part of our agenda going forward, and we see no reason why we can't continue to do so. And by the way, all of that is occurring in the context of a labor market that remains very strong uh, with easing prices leading to rising real wage gains. That also came out today, probably got less attention than the CPI, uh, but for middle wage workers year over year, the real wage gain, the real gain in the hourly wage uh, is 1.6 percent. That's a good number that's going to help uh, as a tailwind in uh, consumer spending. So let's talk about the labor market, Jared, because I know you won't comment directly on Fed policy. You're not going to weigh in on when the Fed should cut. The market, though, now thinks those cuts potentially are going to come significantly later, perhaps as late as July. If policy stays this tight for the next five months, what happens to the labor market over that time? Well, the labor market has been uh, just uh, extremely resilient. I mean, I would argue there are various parts of the economy that have been uh, quite resilient to, to the interest rate trajectory, and the labor market uh, is clearly one of them. I mean, every month you hear these forecasts for, oh, this month we're really going to see a retrenchment, but of course we've had unemployment below 4 percent for two years running and job gains, you know, well north of uh, 200,000 on average. Uh, of course, last month's 353 was, uh, was, a, was a big upside surprise. So the job market mm -hmm. continues to percolate, and I think the theory of the case is not that complicated. I call it a close shave with Occam's razor. The idea being that if we have a 70 percent consumer spending economy, we maintain this tight job market while prices ease. And again, price you know, the rate of inflation did come down in January, 3-4 in December, 3-1 in January. Um, real wage gains, uh, that helps to keep that growth uh, motion going forward uh, from the perspective of the job market and consumers. So then... Mr. Chairman, have you proven wrong Elizabeth Warren, Sherrod Brown, and others who said if the Fed continued on this path, if there was an aggressive move to continue fighting inflation, that it would 
destroy the job market? Because it sure doesn't look like it. Well, I mean, I think if uh, I'm not going to get into an argument with them about that, I mean, I think they're uh, expressing their own concerns about uh, uh, rates. You know, we, as you know, we're not going to comment on Fed monetary policy. What we're doing is trying to keep our heads down and keep that job market uh, going strong while we do all we can to help lower costs. It's that simple. I'm not going to get into fight about interest rates with anybody on either side of that issue. What I'm going to do is try to uh, enact the president's agenda to keep costs going down. Now, we talked a little bit about uh, the cost of insulin, the cost of health care, lower prescription drugs. What we haven't said enough about, uh, you, you mentioned at the beginning, is housing and child care. Those are two areas. Yeah, I, I heard you ask earlier, is there more the administration can do? Well, we have very ambitious plans to lower the cost of housing, to boost the supply of affordable housing, because that is the key intervention point when it comes to housing, increasing the supply of affordable housing. For 10 years now, building affordable housing just doesn't pencil out the way we need it to be. So we have plans, uh, the low-income housing tax credit. We have plans in terms of investing in, uh, in neighborhoods, in homes, in rehabilitation. Um, and it, same thing with affordable child care. So, these are, so this is some really important unfinished business that can make a real difference to working families. All right, Jared, we thank you. Jared Bernstein of the Council of Economic Advisors. Mr. Chairman, thanks for the insights on this CPI day. Coming up, Melinda Herring of the Atlantic Council will be with us. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. You know, our adversaries have long sought to create cracks in the alliance. The greatest hope of all those who wish America harm is for NATO to fall apart. And you can be sure that they all cheered when they heard Donald Trump and heard what he said. I know this. I will not walk away. I can't imagine any other president walking away. President Biden earlier today responding to former President Trump's suggestion of letting Russia attack NATO allies, or even as he said, encourage that behavior. NATO allies who do not pay their bills. Let's go down to Melinda Herring, senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. She's with us at the table today, and it's great to see you, Melinda. Welcome back. Um, I'm sure I can imagine how you feel about what Donald Trump said. Uh, let them do whatever the hell they want, I believe was the idea, uh, or the line in South Carolina. But do you believe that this is uh, an individual who's known for bluster, likes to show off at rallies? Does it really matter when it's Donald Trump? Hey, Joe, thanks for having me. It is a big freaking deal uh, to use the Internet's uh, colloquial slang. You're quoting Joe Biden. Of course. Yeah. But look, it's in some ways it's not a surprise because he's called NATO obsolete. He said that he will not defend Europe if they're attacked. But this is... And some people are saying, calm down. He wasn't so bad in his first administration on Russia and Ukraine. He gave javelins when Obama wouldn't. He kept the sanctions on Crimea. So there is a bit of an argument if you forget the, the perfect phone call, right? Yeah. Uh, but it, I, I think we need to stop pretending. Magical thinking is over. Trump, too, is going to be worse in terms of the wreckage of to American foreign policy than Trump won was. John Bolton has warned over and over again that Trump is serious this time, and he's going to pull you, he's going to pull the United States out of NATO. I don't think he even has to do that, though. I think if he makes this statement a couple more times as president, mm -hmm. NATO's a paper tiger. Well, it's interesting to hear your point on the javelins, because that is actually something that Ukraine's ambassador to the U.S. brought up in an interview with Joe and I just last week. She said, look, the Trump administration, he's the one that provided lethal aid to Ukraine. There is now a real question as to whether or not that lethal aid, monetary aid as well, is going to continue. That is the issue that is now before the House mm -hmm. after the Senate passed a package that would include $60 billion in total. Not all of that just cash going to Ukraine. A lot of that would be spent here for the we creation of weapons that would then go to Ukraine. What changes for Ukraine if the $60 billion comes through? And what happens if it doesn't? So Ukraine stays in the fight if the money comes through. If the money does not come through, Ukraine may not be able to hold out a whole lot longer. It's really existential at this point. The situation on the front line is terrible. The fire rates between the Russian side and the Ukrainian side are 8 to 1. Some say 5 to 1. 
I, I tended to take the eight to one figure more seriously. Uh, and people uh, are saying that they, commanders are saying that they can't make the decisions that they would make if they had enough artillery. Well, Linda Herring, we heard from the Estonian Foreign Intelligence Service this week, and I wondered if you could help us put this in perspective, uh, because it's a startling read uh, from Bloomberg. The Kremlin has about three to four times more artillery than Ukrainian forces after boosting its ammo production to as many as four million units last year. That gap will widen, they found, since it's, quote, almost certain that Western deliveries will not keep pace. Is that with or without this funding? So they're looking at the estimates now. The yeah. EU pledged a million shells by this spring, one million shells. to. So the, can we close that gap, I no, guess is the question? No, the, the EU has only delivered 330,000. The North Koreans have delivered a million shells to Moscow. So there, there's a huge gap, and the Ukrainians have responded smartly by putting a, a lot of money into drones. And they invested uh, an enormous amount in drones, and they now have long-range drones. And we saw what they did in the Black Sea, and we see what they're doing uh, in a number of places in Russia. Is it going to be enough to hold the front line? My concern is that it won't be. And a lot of analysts are, are saying this is getting worse, and we expect Right now, the, the city that everyone's watching that's in ruins that the Russians are likely to take by the end of the month is Adivka. And, and that will be one more city uh, in eastern Ukraine that, where there's absolutely nothing left. Uh, but then the line will, 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 will continue to, to uh, ebb away. So time is of the essence, I think, is, is your primary message here. Even as we consider the fact that the House could perhaps through a discharge petition ultimately pass this aid, mm -hmm. the point has been consistently made. A lot of this is being spent at home. It's going into the defense industrial base. It's being spent in U.S. states. How quickly, realistically, does it translate into Ukraine getting its hands on, on what it needs, being able to use this in the fight? I just wonder what kind of lag we're dealing with here. So the Defense Department is preparing for scenarios, and they can turn things on pretty quickly. So if the House makes the right decision, hopefully as soon as possible, uh, they, can, they can move these weapons and, and turn things around on the front lines quite, quite uh, quickly. That's not the only way that the House could, could uh, change things around. Speaker Johnson is saying no way. So he's, he's interesting. He said that we cannot afford to let Vladimir Putin win, but then he's also said the, the bill is, is dead on arrival, and he's not allowing it on the floor. So a number of Democrats have said, let's use a discharge petition. This is a, a Hail Mary. You yeah. need all the Democrats plus four or five Republicans. There's another possibility now, and I think this is a live possibility. Uh, the House Speaker is holding on by a razor thin Indeed. Yes. So there's a possibility that uh, Republicans could threaten uh, threaten his speakership. Uh, they absolutely could. Some have actually suggested if he puts Ukraine aid on the floor, that's when the motion to vacate could come. A tricky position to be in, to be sure. Melinda Herring, thank you so much, as always, for joining us. We appreciate your time. Now, of course, that margin in the House could get slimmer. Depends on the result of a special election underway in New York's 3rd District. We'll have more on that next. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. Today, voters in New York's 3rd Congressional District head to the polls. It's for a special election to fill the seat left vacant by now-ousted Republican Congressman George Santos. And Bloomberg's Tyler Kendall has more on what's considered a bellwether race. Tyler. Hey, Kaylee. This is the first congressional contest of 2024. Democrats are hoping they can flip the seat. That's because it's in a district President Biden clinched by eight percentage points in 2020. But as Republicans try to hold on to their slim majority in Congress, they're making this race competitive, despite all the controversy surrounding the former congressman. We are due to go for round three of expulsion of Congressman George Santos from NY3. A crucial swing seat in the House was left open. You guys gotta get out of my way. Do you have anything to say to your constituents? After Republican George Santos was ousted from Congress in December. It came amid a scathing House ethics report and a 23-count federal indictment for fraud and campaign finance violations. Santos denies wrongdoing. In light of the expulsion of the gentleman from New York, Mr. Santos, the whole number of the House is now 434. But it's left Republicans in a tight spot. The GOP controls a narrow majority in the House, and New York's congressional seats are seen as key 
for control of the chamber. 18 Republicans won districts in 2022 that favored President Biden. A third were in New York. Democrats want to make up for those losses. New York 3 includes parts of Queens and Long Island's Nassau County. Democrats outnumber both Republicans and independents there, but the district is considered more conservative than the rest of the state. That has some Republican strategists hopeful. That section of New York has the best turnout model of anywhere else in the country for Republicans. But before Santos held the seat, it last belonged to former Congressman Tom Suozzi. He's now the Democratic nominee in this special election. I know how government works. I know how to get things done. I know who to talk to and how to stop things and how to make things happen. Suozzi launched a failed run for governor in 2022 instead of running for a fourth term in the House. He faces Republican nominee Mozzie Pillup. I am against I came to this country legally. I believe in the American dream. I want people to come to this country legally. Pillup was born in Ethiopia and moved to Israel as a child, later serving in the defense forces there. Public records show she's a registered Democrat, despite being elected as a Republican to the county legislature. It's considered a tight race with themes we're seeing resonate nationwide. A recent Siena College survey found voters say Pillup will do a better job addressing immigration concerns while they sided with Swazi for protecting democracy and access to abortion. Pollsters say they're watching to see if these issues will motivate turnout in this unique contest. We're thinking that turnout will be no more than 25 percent. Know that this is a district that in a presidential year, this year, we're probably going to be looking at 62 to 65 percent. Turnout could be further affected by today's winter storm in New York. Both campaigns are offering free rides to the polls and have spent hefty amounts to get people motivated. A Bloomberg News breakdown of campaign finance returns shows Democrats have raised three times as much as Republicans. They're outspending them, too. Joe and Kaylee, more than $22 million have been poured in so far. Oh, many thanks to Bloomberg's Tyler Kendall. Grab a shovel, Tyler, as we continue our conversation on the race to replace former Congressman George Santos's seat with Chapin Fainout, managing director at Actum and a hand in New York Republican politics. Chapin, it's good to see you. Joe Biden won that district by eight points in 2020. George Santos made a mess of things. How is this so close? Well, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it's good to see you guys as well. Um, this is close because of uh, the national political environment and uh, what's happening uh, on the state level in New York. And it's, um, you know, a February special election. Um, I think any other scenario, you might want to give the edge to uh, former Congressman Tom Suozzi. Uh, it's sort of his district. He's been elected there. Uh, countywide um, for decades. Um, family is prominent there. But a low turnout special election in February is how Republicans, you know, is, is their best chance to hold the seat. Uh, they have a strong candidate. Uh, and again, I think um, we're looking at what the issues that are going to motivate voters are. Uh, you just mentioned uh, that Swazi is better on protecting democracy and abortion, which I think will probably be litigated in the uh, 2024 general presidential election uh, in November. But I don't know that that's going to motivate voters in the district as much as immigration, which this is a suburban, this is a New York City suburban district. We're watching all day, every day, 24-7, the news uh, of how the border is affecting New York and New York City. And the people who live in New York 3 live there because they don't want the problems of the city. They want to live in the suburbs uh, and feel yeah. safe. So I do think that's the more motivating factor. So I do think she has a slight edge, but it will be close no matter what happens. Well, and Chapin, to the point about this electorate, where exactly they are, we're talking Long Island here. And even if there's, these are national issues that are uh, a factor as voters are heading to the polls today, the few of them that may be doing so, should we be reading this electorate actually as a tell on how things could go in the state of New York more widely come November or anything nationally? Or is this just unique? Well, that's a great question. It's, it's, it's a little hard to tell, right? Because we do not have um, President Biden uh, and President Trump on the top of the ticket, uh, presuming those are the two candidates in the fall. So it's hard to sort of paint um, the national election in 2024 with this brush. However, I do think it'll partially be a referendum on President Biden. If you think the country is trending in the right direction, you're going to vote for Tom Suozzi. If you do not, uh, you're probably going to vote for uh, Maisie Phillips. So I think that... Um, um, in terms of bellwether, it's a referendum among President Biden. And if the Republicans win, that's going to be good news for them uh, on the on the um, uh, for the general election uh, with Biden. And if they uh, if the Republicans lose, I think, uh, you know, the Democrats can breathe a little bit uh, easier 
Uh, though, again, you know, we're a lifetime away from from November, which which, uh, you know, will have different um, issues being litigated uh, in, in all the races across the country. Chapin Fay, as we've discussed uh, with you on this program before, you actually worked for a short time for George Santos. You decided to leave that job on your own to the extent that you knew him or, or know him now. What mark did he leave on this seat or on the district? Because it sure looks like voters have moved on. Well, I think uh, when the scandal first arose, you know, Chairman Cairo, the Nassau County Republican chairman, um, and the Republican Party in Nassau have just been on a complete tear winning elections. They have won all three towns, um, which are very important in the district, the countywide offices, and they've just been on a winning streak. And they are well organized, well funded. And, you know, um, Chairman Cairo is the ultimate, you know, uh, head coach here. Um, so I think he has done a great job. Uh, um, of sort of rebuilding the brand in Nassau County. If you recall a couple of years ago yeah. or a couple of cycles ago, you know, the county executive went to prison, uh, a town supervisor was in legal trouble, his son was a senator, he lost, and, you know, it just sort of went off a cliff. Uh, there were Republicans who couldn't wait to vote against the Republican Party, and Chairman Cairo and the uh, Nassau County Republicans have brick by brick built that back. Um, so I think in the beginning of the Santos scandal, you know, everyone was a little worried. Is there a crack in this wall that they've built uh, brick by brick? Um, but I think by now um, the Republicans have campaigned so well, have just been, you know, um, hitting, firing on all cylinders every election cycle uh, in their organization. That I do think people have moved on a little bit from Santos. And you'll see they're not really, I mean, it's an undercurrent and people talk about it. And, you know, Congressman mm -hmm. Swazi has sort of been trying to tie the Republicans uh, and his opponent to him. But I think people have kind of moved on. Um, you know, George Santos was an anomaly. Um, at least around here. And, you know, um, he'll, he will he will be replaced uh, for better or worse uh, tonight. Yeah, well, to your point on the Republican Party, Chief, and it's been described to us in this district as a machine. Does the machine work as well during a nor'easter? Are we seeing signs that it's working? Well, um, we were concerned this morning. Uh, the snow has stopped. Um, and in the city, the snow uh, fall hasn't been as great. Uh, on Long Island, there is some snow. It's being cleared. I do think that will affect, and I do think that's a point towards Swazi if people stay home um, uh, in this special election. You know, the Republicans need to get, um, need to motivate their base to get out and vote. Um, but they're doing that. I mean, they have thousands and thousands of people out there. Um, I, you know, from what I've read and seen, um, it looks like the Republicans are much more organized. But then again, you know, the Democrats have the unions out there and, and their same, um, you know, boots on the ground as well. Um, and, and they claim to have made, a, you know, a million voter contacts. So you never really know who has the lead on the ground unless, you know, you live in the district and you're mm -hmm. being knocked uh, on your door. Um, but, I, you know, some of the things I'm looking for, like I said before, um, which message is going to motivate voters to the ballot box? I, I'm not sure uh, abortion, while it's an important issue in New York, is going to motivate people this cycle. Or, I'm sorry, this special election. Uh, I do think the immigration um, issue will motivate uh, some voters in this district. And then on the ground, you know, whoever has the better ground game really is going to pull out votes. And that becomes even more important uh, on a snowy <laughs> Tuesday in February. <laughs> Well, there's still three hours and 20 minutes to go for those who haven't cast their vote yet. The polls are open until 9 p.m. Eastern. Thank you so much for joining us, Chapin. We appreciate your time. Chapin Fay, Actum Managing Director. Now, still coming up, President Biden is urging House Speaker Mike Johnson to bring the supplemental package the Senate passed this morning to the floor in the other chamber. We'll get the latest with our political panel next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. It's a matter of standing by our allies. It's a matter of American lives potentially being on the line if Ukraine and its brave war effort falters because of inaction here in the United States Congress by extreme MAGA Republicans. That was the Democratic leader, Congressman Hakeem Jeffries, earlier today. Joining us now is our political panel, Lisa Camusa Miller, former RNC communications director and the host of the Friday Reporter podcast, and Kristen Hahn of Rock Solutions. So something else that Speaker, uh, 
Democratic leader Jeffries said today was he thinks there's 300 votes there for this package if it actually comes to the floor. He said he'll use every legislative tool to see that this gets a vote. Seems like we're hinting at a discharge petition here, Lisa. We haven't seen many of those that have actually worked. Could this one? Oh, I don't know. I think everything after watching the way the floor operates these days, I mean, it all remains to be seen. But certainly I think that it could be a possibility and one that, I mean, everything's on the table this year. So absolutely. And I think the leader's not wrong. I mean, this is an issue that we have failed. Republicans and Democrats have failed to communicate back home as to why it is that a stable Europe is a stable U.S. And that's something that has got to be communicated better and better. So Kristen, do we really believe 300 votes? So if you drop that on the floor today, you have that many supporting this bill? Because if that's the case, Speaker Johnson might have to get out of the way. I think that there really could be. I mean, this is one of those very unique instances, and you're talking about discharge petitions, which 99.9% .9 of the time are completely out of the question. Yeah. But this is something that has so much support among members of both parties. Well, we talk about both parties, and primarily we're questioning whether or not there would be enough Republicans to get on board. There were 22 Republicans who voted yes in the Senate. There were three Democrats, though, who voted no, mm -hmm. specifically finding a problem with the fact that this pro provides billions of dollars uh, of more funding to mm -hmm. Israel when there is concern for civilian life in Gaza. There's a lot of left-leaning Democrats in the House. I wonder if we're not properly accounting for those votes that may go the other way. I think the, the Democratic leadership does a good job of counting, um, hmm. counting votes, uh, particularly in our own party. But that's why I think you have to have a governing majority to vote. It will have to be a significant number of Democrats, a significant number of Republicans, because you're going to lose people kind of on the fringes. Um, so, you know, that's why uh, the idea of a discharge petition, while I don't think it's going to happen, is so interesting, but also why... You know, when you're looking at the speaker and you're wondering who he's, who he's talking to, and it's really Donald Trump, because otherwise, you know, the majority of the House wants to do this. Yeah, we can ask Al Green about counting votes at some <laughs> point. But uh, look, Lisa, at the statement from Speaker Johnson. You worked for a speaker. This is a preemptive rejection of a bill. This hadn't even passed yet. In the absence of having received any single border policy change from the Senate, even though one was struck out of this bill for it to pass. The House will have to continue to work on its own will on these matters. America deserves better than the Senate's status quo. You don't even wait for the bill to arrive? I think he knows his conference pretty well, the Speaker, and I think he knows that this is a non-starter. I don't think, I, he would not have issued this statement if he didn't know that he didn't have the support for it. Hmm. And that, I think, is, I think it's preemptive. I think that it's smart because it's probably not gonna go the way. He had a bill with the border attached. Can he we did. acknowledge that? He did. Yeah. Yeah. DOA. Yeah. Okay. Well, as we think about the calculation here, though, for the speaker, he, of course, has faced threats from the likes of Marjorie Taylor Greene. If you put anything with Ukraine aid on the floor, I will b issue a motion to vacate. I will try to get that process going. We know Speaker McCarthy fell victim to that, but eight Republicans voted to oust McCarthy. Do you think the votes would be there to oust Johnson, or is this kind of an empty threat? No, I think it's an empty threat. I mean, uh, the one thing I will say, Haley, is that it really does feel like the conference itself, the Republican conference, is really rallying around the speaker. He has really, he has got a lot of goodwill amongst his membership. Does he have a fractured conference? He absolutely does, but so has every speaker before him for the last three that I can remember on the Republican side. So it's been a challenge. There's no question about it. I think what he's trying to do is he try, he's trying to manage that. Mm -hmm. A threat that's coming from, uh, from Marjorie Taylor Greene isn't necessarily a threat from a reasonable and loud side. It's, a, excuse me, a loud side of the conference, but not necessarily a majority of the conference. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to think, though, that he does have a finger on the pulse of what's happening. Well, I'll tell you, and if uh, this special election goes yeah. to Democrats in New York tomorrow, we're talking about a spread of two seats uh, is there a conversation about power sharing at some point in that world, or we just have a stalemate for the rest of this Congress? I think you have a stalemate for the rest of the conference. I don't think, I mean, the reason why I think the Speaker has so much goodwill among, you know, a lot of the members on the right is because he's not budging. He's not yeah. legislating. He's not governing. Um, so what are you left with? You're left with a stalemate. There we are in Washington. Coming up, former President Trump is endorsing his daughter-in-law, Laura Trump, as co-chair <laughs> of the Republican Party. We'll be back with our political panel, maybe sing a little Tom Petty coming up next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. They are the oldest people 
ever to run for president, breaking by only four years the record that they set! <laughs> Objectively old, they're at the age. There are no more age-related milestones to hit. <laughs> they got the ARP card. They've got Social Security. They've got their movie discounts. There is no, oh, wait till you hit 88, you get to drink and drive. No! <laughs> you get a hundred candles eventually. That's uh, John Stewart, of course, making his big return as host of The Daily Show last night. Uh, for Mondays only. Uh, Kristen Hahn and Lisa Camuso Miller are back with us as we turn to our panel for guidance. Uh, Kristen, it's been a tough week for Joe Biden on the age problem, and a lot of his allies are encouraging him to embrace it, to actually run with that, a la Dark Brandon. Can he actually pull that off? I think he can. I mean, there's a lot of talk about letting the president be the president, mm -hmm. right? Like, I mean, you don't have to be perfect all the time. You can have gaffes here and there. But it's what's really clear is that the Republicans have united behind this strategy of really going after that. And, you know, because that's really what they have on him right now. Um, and the more they can talk about that, the more you can ignore the outrageous things that Donald Trump is saying that are actually very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Well, we've talked about his NATO comments in recent days on this program already. On the age question, though, you're starting to see more Democrats feel that they need to come to President Biden's defense on this, including Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. He spoke with reporters earlier about Biden's mental fitness. Take a listen. I talk to President Biden, you know, regularly, off sometimes several times in a week or usually several times in a week. His mental acuity is great. It's fine. It's as good as it's been over the years. I've been speaking to him for 30 years since we worked on the Brady Bill and the assault weapons ban when I was a young congressman. I'm not sure how many uh, young Republican congressmen regularly speak with the president, Lisa, but certainly Republican chairs of committees like the Judiciary and Oversight Committee want to hear from the special counsel who really brought the age and memory issue to all of our uh, front of mind last week, Robert Herr. They'd like him to come talk to him. How consequential is that? Uh, I've been married for 20 years, and any time the word fine comes out when I ask how I look, I call it the other F word. And that's twice <laughs> now that twice now that I have seen people say, the president and now Chuck Schumer say, that his mental acuity is fine. fine. I'm not feeling real confident about that. Set that all aside. I do think that there is a, a general question amongst Republicans and also Democrats about why it is the special counsel brought this to light now. There's been some questioning about whether or not this is similar to what happened with Comey when he came out and he talked about Hillary Clinton and her qualifications. There were so many things that to unpack here. And as Kristen and I said earlier, not a lot of governing is going to be happening this year. Mm -hmm. So why not make mischief where you can in a political year when it really is a battle for the White House? Can we talk about your former RNC, which appears to be in the process of being taken over by Donald Trump? Ronald McDaniel will sunset after South Carolina, as we've discussed. Uh, not only does uh, Matt Waitley make the chairmanship in Donald Trump's view, but his daughter-in-law, Laura Trump, would be co-chair in the structure that he outlined. Is the this a problem? What, what is a co-chair going to do in that role? So the co-chair is, is actually a role that's been in place at the RNC for a very long time. There's uh -huh. a chairman and then there's a co-chair. And typically if the chair is male, then the co-chair is female. So this actually is quite, sim quite similar and quite historic in the way that this has always been done. Laura Trump has been out and about and very vocal about how De how defensive and how much she believes in her father-in-law mm -hmm. as a good candidate for the role. So someone that is a staunch advocate for the candidate typically does get that position. The co-chair, uh, I can't think of in recent times that a family member has had that role, but it is definitely in the family, Got if it. you will, sure. in the party as it, as it is. And the co-chair typically is a spokesperson for um, groups like females, um, minority groups uh, and typically does a lot of work on the stump and that's what that role probably would do. I'm not surprised actually to hear that Laura Trump would be someone that he'd consider for that role. Is this just more evidence, Kristen, of the entire Republican Party apparatus lining up behind one man? 
I mean, I think so. The they can't quit him. You know, I mean, like it took forever <laughs> for Nikki Haley to be critical of him at all, and she's running against him. And I just don't see many signs that you know that they're ready to move along from from Donald Trump. They're exactly scared of him. The Biden campaign wants to see, right? Mm -hmm. Am I right about that still, or has that changed? I don't think that's changed. The swing state polls might challenge the theory behind it. Although I, I've said it before, and I'll say it again, you cannot underestimate um, Donald Trump. They have a more sophisticated operation this yeah. time around. Absolutely, and we have to leave it there. But thank you both for joining us this evening. Kristen Hahn and Lisa Camusa. Lisa Camusa Miller, we appreciate your time. And of course, you can get more Washington coverage by checking out the Washington Edition newsletter on the terminal and online. Thanks a lot for spending time with us on Balance of Power here on Bloomberg TV and Radio. We'll meet you back here tomorrow, live from Washington. This is Bloomberg.